Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you. Lord, we pray that you would come and speak to our hearts in a powerful, powerful way. Lord, we pray that we come into this place one way, but we leave another. That you've done something transformational in the process of our heart and our life and our walk with you. Let your words come forth today in a powerful way. In Jesus' name, we all said, Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Looking forward to, to speaking on our, our second part of a series we started last week. Uh, you saw the, the, the little film there simply just called Altars. And uh, we're, we're going to dive really deep into this concept over the next several weeks uh, of altars. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but altars are one of the most significant topics in all of the Bible, uh, specifically the, the Old Testament. And we have a little bit of maybe strange theology on, on what most people, when I ask most people, uh, what is an altar, they, they think that it's the very front part uh, of a church by the, by the stage. And, and that is true, that is an altar, but that's not the only place an altar is. An altar can be any place, and it can be at any time. Any time you meet with God, it, it's an altar. Altars are a place that you meet with, with God. Altars mark significant places in our life, and altars represent a, a starting place for entering to the presence of God. Last week, uh, I shared a message. I actually shared three separate stories uh, of altar experiences that, that I had and how God did significant things in my life at, at each one of those. If you weren't able to be here last week, I'd encourage you to go to our Washington Township YouTube page. Uh, you can get a link from that from our, our website or from our app, and it'll link you right in there and to stay plugged in. But really an altar's way of saying, hey, the God who got me here, he can get me there. And the God who did this, he can do that. It, it, it's a transitional place where God does something in our life, and we see them time and time again through scriptures. The, the Old Testament, the patriarchs, the, the great prophets, the, the kings, they all see the significance uh, of altars, uh, of building altars. As a matter of fact, really almost every person, uh, especially in the Old Testament, that has something really incredible take place in their life, we, we see some, a trend that takes place, and it's really that they're marked by not just an altar, but really a trail of altars. It became a common place in their life to build a, a trail of, of altars. We looked at the life of Abraham last week and the, the trail of altars that he built to, to get him to that place. But we see them in, in people's lives like Noah and, and Abraham and Isaac, Jacob, Joshua, Samuel, King David. The list goes on and on and on. But they all built altars to God. And this is my statement for us today. If you want to get close to God, build an altar. If you came into this place and you said, I've been looking and longing to go to a deeper place with God, build an altar. Altars serve many different purposes, uh, but they can accomplish great things that only can be done at that place. So last week we looked at the life of Abraham, and we looked at the altar of covenant. We looked at the Abrahamic covenant that was built there in an altar, that the many nations would come from him, and that truthfully Jesus himself would come through him, and we are under that same covenant. It's the altar of covenant that, that God made with Abraham. Today we're going to look at, I want you to write this down, the altar of sovereignty. The altar of sovereignty, and we're going to look at really one of my favorite characters or one of my favorite Bible stories. We're going to look at the, the prophet Elijah. And we're going to look at this altar experience that he had, and it's the altar of sovereignty. It speaks to this greater reality that God is not just prominent, which means he's important, but also that he's preeminent, which means he's first and foremost, that he has the first place in our life. He's not just a part, a part of our life. And so I'm going to encourage you to turn your Bibles to, to 1 Kings chapter 18, and we're going to see this powerful kind of battle that takes place on Mount Carmel. And Elijah, he is addressing this king named Ahab, but he's really addressing the people of God. And it's a lesson that he's going to use to teach the people of God. And this is what he's going to teach them, that, that they have been under two opinions for far too long. That they've been serving two gods, and it's time to come to the altar uh, of sovereignty where God truly becomes preeminent. I like to say it like this, Jesus isn't Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. Let me say it again. Jesus is either Lord of all or he is not Lord at all. You can't have it one way or the other. He has to be Lord of all, first, primary. All things come under his banner. There's, there's no middle ground. And so what I want to do today is kind of look at this place, Mount Carmel, 
This is where this incredible battle in 1 Kings 18 starts. It's a modern day picture of the, of the mountain there and, and this altar that was constructed. And we're going to look at that story. It's an incredible story throughout scriptures. And, and you can see the, the mountain there. Uh, the, the picture there on, on, on the right side is the valley that you see from uh, Mount Carmel. And it, it's the Jezreel or, or the Megiddo Valley, which we kind of know as Armageddon. This is where uh, the great battle of Armageddon will take place place uh, to fulfill those end time scriptures. And so there was this one great battle really between uh, uh, Elijah and King Ahab, really the Baal, gods of Baals versus God of Israel. Uh, what, I could get on a whole big tangent on this, but where eventually the greatest battle of all time will take place right there, the battle of Armageddon. So let me kind of paint the picture because we know some people are kind of coming into faith still kind of learning some of these things. So let me give you just a, a quick background on, on who Elijah is and how this works and where King Ahab comes from. So Israel was, was a nation. They began to have kings. Uh, and then David had a son named Solomon. After Solomon, uh, the kingdom of Israel divides. It has a separation between it. And, and ten, there's 12 tribes of Israel. Ten tribes go up, and they become the, the, the northern kingdom. And then there's two southern tribes, and, and they are called Judah. So when you're reading through First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles, and you see uh, the king of Israel versus the king of Judah, and you're saying, "Why I don't know? Well, I have the same kings." No, that Israel had been divided into two nations really at this time, and two separate kingdoms. And so the story that we're going to look at it takes place in, in the northern kingdom, or or what was called Israel. And it's a very important thing to understand that. So at this point, uh, a king named Ahab comes, and he's ruling over Israel. And I guess the best way I can say this is he is one bad dude. He, he is not good, and, and he marries the, the, this princess or this lady named Jezebel. How many of you have ever heard of Jezebel before, right? If you, if you kind of in the church circles, it says something like this. It says, oh, that has, she has a Jezebel spirit and this. Well, well King Ahab and Jezebel, they were, they were, they were terrible. Uh, two of the most evil and brutal people that, that ever ruled or reigned. Uh, they led people into sin by building up temples, uh, false gods. Ahab himself actually sacrifices his own sons. Uh, he's part of this lineage of kings that they're described as self-serving, away from the, the, the God of Israel. They care nothing for God's people. In 1 Kings 16, a few chapters back from where we're going to talk about today, verse 30 says this, Ahab did more evil than any of those who came before him. So he was a bad guy. And in the midst of this, uh, a prophet named Elijah, now this is Elijah with a J, right? You guys know there's an Elijah and there's an Elijah. This is Elijah with a J. Uh, the prophet Elijah, he rises up to come and stand for righteousness, stand for God. And we see this in 1 Kings 17. Let me just chase a little side thing here for a minute. Hey, when things are bad, God will always have somebody rise up for him. Amen? Amen. So, hey, you don't need to worry about the culture, the climate uh, of the day and age that we live. God will always call his people outward. And so in this time, he calls this prophet. In, in, in uh, chapter 17, this is what Elijah proclaims says, as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, whom I serve, there will neither be dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. So Elijah, he comes on the scene. Ahab is bad. He goes and he goes and speaks to Ahab and he says, because of all your idolatry, because of all uh, the, the idols to the Asherahs and to the Baals that you have built, you need to know until I say the word, there will be no dew and there will be no rain upon this land. There will be a, a great, great drought. Now, let me just get you a little teaching here. And I want you to hold on to this because we're going to end in the same place. Oftentimes in scriptures and oftentimes in our life, there's a physical sign in, in the natural that's mirroring something in the, in, in the spiritual. And I'll put this slide up there and this, this will say it properly. God often has to get our attention in the natural before he can talk to us about the supernatural. So the real problem, you guys have that slide, I want you to put that up there for me. God often has to get our attention in the natural before he can talk to us about the, the, the supernatural. So God will get his people's attention through natural signs of what's taking place in the spiritual. So Elijah comes and he says, there will be no rain, there will be no dew, there will be a drought in the land because there is a spiritual drought in the people of God. You with me? So there's a physical sign of what's taking place in the spiritual here in, in this story. Let's, now let's pick up the story. This is where we're going to kind of spend the rest of our time. 1 Kings chapter 18, okay? Verse 1, 
After a long time, in the third year, the word of the Lord came to Elijah. Go and present yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain on the land. So chapter 17, three to three and a half years before this time, he comes before Ahab and he says, until I speak the word, until I prophesy the word, there will be no dew, there will be no rain. And then here's what happens. He has to go and hide out for a while because Jezebel decides she is going to kill all of the prophets of God. And so uh, Elijah goes into hiding. There's some, in, in chapter 17 is an amazing story uh, of, of him being fed supernaturally and taking care of him. It, it's great. And so here he comes out after these three years. He says, go present yourself to him. Now let's jump up to, to verse 17. And this is what happens when he goes to him. When he saw Elijah, he said to him, is that you, you troubler of Israel? He says this, I have not made trouble for you, Elijah replied, but you and your father's family have. You have abandoned the Lord's commands and have followed the Baals. Now summon the people from all over Israel to meet on Mount Carmel and bring the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. So this is what he does. He says, here's what we're going to do. We're going to have a showdown. All right? We We like good showdowns, right? And he says, you go get the 450 prophets of Baal, and you go get the 400 prophets of Asherah, and you show up, and let's go up to that mountain, and let's see who the real God is. This is one of the best stories. And Elijah is sick and tired, and he says, enough is enough. You know, sometimes in our life, we just got to say enough is enough. And enough is enough. I mean, you think Ali Frazier was a great battle? That said nothing compared to the battle that was going to take place on that mountain. Verse 20 says this, so Ahab, he sent word throughout all of Israel and assembled the prophets on Mount Carmel. Elijah went before the people and said, how long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. Now, this is one of the most like fascinating, difficult passages in all scriptures. But the people said, what do they say? Nothing. They said nothing. There's a, there, there, there's a physical drought because the people of God are in a spiritual drought. And Elijah says, pick now whom you're going to serve. If you're going to serve the God of Israel, serve him. If you're going to serve the God of Baal, serve him. But it's time to pick, and they say nothing. And it's sobering words. These people have become so indifferent to the things of God, they can't even make a statement anymore. And I, I think about in our culture and in our, in our church and in the church, how many times we remain silent when we're confronted with a choice between who we're going to serve. I, I want you to catch this thought. Indifference is a silent amen to the enemy's plans and purposes. Indifference, it's a silent amen to the enemy's plans and purposes. Sometimes God's calling his church to make a stand. And we tend to be people with one foot here and one foot there. We, we do have one foot in the kingdom, and we say we love the... Well, there's so many parts of this world that we love, and we're this same people that Elijah's trying to get his attention to, and we want Jesus, but we want everything else too. This is what Jesus has to say about that. Matthew 6, 24 says this, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and mammon. Some translations you might have say, man, you cannot serve God and money. Well, well, mammon's the proper translation. Mammon's, it's another false god. It's, it's another Babylonian god. It's, it's another Baal. It's another Astra. It's the, it's the god of provision. It's the god of money. It's the god of power. And it says, you can't serve both. And these are Jesus' words. I love the way 1 Kings 18.20 is written in the ESV. It says, how long will you go limping between two opinions? And Elijah's saying, enough is enough. You have to begin to pick where you're going to be. In Israel, they're a lukewarm people. And we know in Revelation when it talks about the church of Laodicea, this lukewarm. It says, I have to spit you out of my mouth. Be hot or be cold. Devotion to both Yahweh and the Baals is impossible. God cannot receive that kind of worship. Y'all with me? He can't. It's against who he is. There's a big difference between the two. And I want to help you with this because I say this all the time. Satan has no new tricks. It's the same thing repeating itself and repeating itself and repeating itself over and over. And so this culture, they they find themselves where our culture finds it. Hey, the important thing is we have some kind of religion, right? I mean, we're serving something. 
We're, we're, we're worshiping something. We're, we're sincere about it. We're, we're following our hearts there. Hey, whatever sounds good. I mean, it sounds like our day and age. Hey, all religions, they lead to the same place. We're all going to get there. We're all sincere in our hearts. We're all good people. And Elijah's saying, no way. You're either going to serve Baal or you're going to serve Yahweh. You have to pick. You have to decide. For us today, this is our translation. How many Sundays are going to come and go? How many sermons are you going to hear? You've got to eventually pick which side are you going to land in. We can't live in a world of indifference anymore. And, and, and so we get to this story, and, and Elijah, he, does, he sets up this great showdown on, on the mountain. And he says, here's what we're going to do. We're going to build altars. And we're going to put a sacrifice down. And he says, whatever God comes and consumes their sacrifice with fire, they are the real God. And, and, and Elijah's just sick and tired of it all. He says, let's get to the point and let's find out who the real God is. Let's go up to the mountain. You go get all of your prophets. You go get all, all, all those people who worship. And let's go up to the mountain and let's see what happens. Let, let's see who the real God is. 1 Kings 18, let's jump up to verse 26. So this is what the, the, the prophets of, of Baal and Asherah do. They took the bull given them and, and prepared it. And then they begin to call upon the name of Baal from morning till noon. Baal, answer us, they shouted. But there was no, say it with me, there was no response. No one answered. And they danced around the altar that they had made at noon. I love this. Now Elijah's like, he's getting confident. He began to taunt them, shout louder. He said, surely he's a god. Perhaps he's deep in thought or busy. Maybe he's out traveling. Maybe he's sleeping and you must awaken. So listen to this. They shouted louder. They slashed themselves with sword and spears as was their custom until blood flowed. Satan has no new tricks, guys. He has no new tricks. Midday passed and they continued their frantic prophesy until the, cane, until, until the time for the evening sacrifice, but there was no response. No one answered. No one paid attention. So just, just understand this. These, these people, they had faith. They just had misplaced faith. It's one they didn't have faith. And I, and I want to just ask you a difficult question. How many of you, maybe you have faith, but it's misplaced faith? I mean, your, your faith is in your job. Faith is in our government will protect you. Just, it's just misplaced faith. And, and so the question that we have to, Elijah says, get all the prophets. Go find every single one of them. And, and Elijah set up. Now he said, now it's time, God's time to shine. And, and he says, I'm going to build an altar, and we're going to see how our God shows up. Now, we're going to look today. I want you to write this. I'm not going to spend a long time in it, but five things of how we build an altar of sovereignty. How do we build an altar where we show that God's first? How do we build this altar? First thing is this, we are invited to worship. I want you to look at verse 30. First King 18, 30. Then Elijah said to all the people, come here to me. They came to him and he repaired the altar of the Lord which had been torn down. Uh, Elijah, he drew the people in. He started with this invitation. He said, notice, he said, come to me. I, I just want to help us. The altar always starts with worship. If we're fully devoted to what God, to God in worship, we have to draw close to Him. It's in His presence that our lives are changed. It's why we start our services with, with, with praise and worship, because that's the, it's the entry point. It's how we get going. And so here's what happened. As they drew close to Elijah, they drew close to the Spirit inside Elijah. Amen? They, they begin to feel the presence of God. Why? Because in the Old Testament, the, the, the God was always responded to an item or a thing or to a person. So the, the people of God, the, the prophets, were the people's way of engaging into God. You with me? So he said, draw them in. Come. And, and they, as they drew closer to Elijah, they saw the spirit of God living with inside him. Man, Jesus is inviting all of us. says, come and worship. Come, all you who are weary. Come, all you who are tired. Come, all you who are burdened. Come to the altar. Come and worship. He makes an invitation. Come. C come close. And it's the starting place. The, the second thing is this. We're, we're called to, to build an altar. We, we, we've got to begin to physically build some altars in, in our life. Then Elijah said, still in verse 30, to all the people, come here to me. They came and saw him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord, which had been torn down. Elijah builds an altar. 
And I want you to catch this. God didn't show up and like this lightning strike and all of a sudden the altar was put back together. I mean, he had to go and fi- sometimes we got to physically do some things. Y'all with me? We, we just think everything's always going to happen in the spirit, but God sometimes is calling us to put our faith in action. And, and so he says he, he repaired it. He did it. He, he picked up stone by stone by stone on the mountain and began. That's why I love that little video we showed before the sermon series of putting the altar together. It, it's word. It's a step of faith. He picks up the stone and he begins to see God moving. And I love this, that, God, that Elijah, he doesn't just build the altar, but what does it say? It says he's rebuilding the altar. It means there was an altar there at one time that had gone away. The foundation was still there, but it had gone to ruins. How many altars in our life that were once there are now just rubble? And God's calling us this morning, the altar of sovereignty, put the altars back together. Go back to those places where I started the process in, in your life. He, he repaired something that once stood strong. The once the, the altar at Carmel. And Elijah looked to revive something that once was. Stone by stone, scrap by scrap, he begins to put it back on the foundations. He, he, he rebuilt trust with God one stone at a time. And it's amazing. If you read the story, it says this. He went and he gathered 12 large stones. Why 12? He, he's reminding all the Israelites, just like the tribe, just like we are 12 groups together, tri- tri- 12 tribes of Israel, we come back together, we form this altar together. And, and maybe the Lord's just speaking to you right now. He's saying, what altars have gone in disrepair in your life? What things have you let stand for way too long? What did you once do, but you no longer do? He says, come, build it together. Be- begin, begin to do this. And God's speaking. He's calling you. Come and worship. Come and rebuild the altar. I, mean, I believe that we live in this generation that desperately really wants a divine encounter. You saw the video up there. A divine encounter with the living presence of God. But I'm afraid we're not teaching them how to build altars anymore. I mean, it, it's good to come in and come out and come in. But there's something that happens when you build an altar. And you stay a while. And you say, God, you're going to have to do something in this place. Some things have got to change in my life. Uh, I shared with you those three stories last week because those are the moments of building those altars where God begins to establish things in, in, in your life. He's saying you can't be double-minded anymore. So you have to step into the invitation to worship. You have to build or rebuild the altars. And maybe this is your first time here in service today. Today you're going to build an altar. Say, God, I'm going to start a process of a relationship with you. An altar is just simply a place we meet with God. It can be any time and it can be any place. The third thing is this. We will be required to lay a sacrifice at the altar. Verse 33 says this. He arranged the wood, cut the bowl into pieces, and laid it on the wood. Elijah puts the sacrifice on the altar. If you miss everything I say, don't miss this right now. Every altar demands a sacrifice. Something has to be laid down. Y'all with me? I'm speaking to you this morning. Man, there's some things in our life, I don't know if you're with me, there's some things in our life, it's time to lay them down. Every altar demands a sacrifice. And we have been holding on to some things for way too long, we got to let them go. And this is, this is the, the altar of sovereignty. Who are we going to serve, the world or God? This kingdom or his kingdom, we have to make some decisions, but every altar requires a sacrifice. When you're serious about the Lord, he's going to do this. He's going to begin to pinpoint to you some areas of your life it's time to lay down. It's called conviction. It's called repentance. It's a beautiful thing. Amen? Amen. It's a beautiful thing that God does in our life. So what do we need to, to lay down? What's hindering us from full relationship with Jesus? Number four, and the worship team, you guys can help me out. We need to pour out our trust on the altar. Now, this story begins to pick up pace here, and it it gets amazing. Listen to this. He says this, verse 33b. When he said to them, then he said to them, fill four large jars with water and pour it on the offering and on the wood. Do it again, he said, and they did it again. Do it a third time, he ordered, and they did it a third time. The water ran down around the altar and even filled the trench. So they build this altar, and Elijah says this. Those four containers of water, douse it. Remember the goal here is fire. With me? Now how many know 
Water and fire, they're not a great mix, right? So douse it, he says. Do it again. And he triples down. Do it one more time. The water was so heavy over this altar, it filled the trench around it. Now, I love this because now Elijah has allowed the people, okay, participation in building the altar. Up to this point, he led the way. Now he says, okay, guys, it's your time, and here's what we're going to do. We're going to build trust one bucket at a time. Now, I want you to think about this for a minute. I want you to catch the whole scenario of the story here. We're coming out of three and a half year what? Drought. And God tells Elijah, go take the thing that's the most precious to them and tell them to pour it out. If you're in a drought, what do you need? And he says, don't just pour a cup. Don't just pour a gallon. Don't just pour four gallons. Do it again. I mean, they must have been like, man, I'm parched. <laughs> you know? We haven't seen rain in three and a half years. You want me to go dump all this water again? He says, dump it again. Dump it again. You see, this is not just about God overcoming a pile of wood soaked by water, but about God moving in the midst of our greatest vulnerabilities. God loves to show off by asking us to give from the place we have the least. Elijah demonstrates to them ultimate faith and ultimate trust. When God calls you to do something, be confident in his word. You know, this is the way it works. I don't know if I understand this whole thing, but when we need something, you know what we have to sacrifice? What we need. Time and time again through scripture. Man, I, man I'm just broke. I have no money. I don't know how to do this. Bring a tithe. You with me? I mean, I teach you guys this every single week. We, we don't tithe to just give money away. We're doing a spiritual principle. We're saying, God, we kind of need this stuff to get through this. These bills keep on coming, but I'm going to give what I think I need most so you can bless the rest. Man, I'm so, I'm so tired, and my days are just running out on me. I have no time. God says, give me time. What you have the least of, you have to give the most of, and then God can bless it. Y'all, what I'm preaching right now, you good? So he tells the people, what you have least, what you think you need the most, pour it out. Number five. We can, we then, building this altar of sovereignty, we can boldly step out in confidence. This story is about ready to take off. Verse 36 and 37, at, at the time of the sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed, Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and have done all these things at your command. Did you hear this prayer? He's telling them. He's reminding the people who they are. He's reminding them. You, you are the God of our forefathers, of Abraham and Isaac and, and, and Jacob and these 12 stones that are laid of, of your 12 sons. And I've done everything as you've commanded. He says, answer me, Lord, answer me so these people will know that you, Lord, are God. And that you are turning their hearts, say it with me, back again. We can't be in two places at the same time. We can't be two places physically at the same time, and we can't be spiritually in two places at the same time. You're either going to choose the kingdom of this world, or you're going to choose the kingdom of God. And this story is all about choosing your God. And Elijah, he prays confidently. He prays. He's captured the heart of God. And because they've captured the heart of God, their hearts are now being changed. This is what it says in verse 38. Then, I love this, the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood and the stone and the soil, and also licked up all the water from the trench. So God doesn't just send a fire. He sends what? A consuming fire. That all that water that was poured on, it's evaporated in a second. I just want to tell you this. God wants to send a consuming fire in your life, and he doesn't want some of you. He wants all of you. You remember in verse 21, it says this, the people were silent. Listen to what happens in verse 39, when we build an altar of sovereignty. When all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried, the Lord, he is God. Say it with me. The Lord, he is God. Their heart 
hearts have been changed. They went through this process of building an altar. Guys, if you want to meet with God, you've got to build an altar. Let me quickly kind of sum up the story for you here in our last few minutes. So Elijah now, this fire consumes the, this whole thing, and the people of God are repentant, and they're falling down on their face, and they're coming, and they're worshiping God, and says, He is the Lord. He's the Lord. We choose our allegiance. And then Elijah says, you know those 850 prophets? Go get them. He says this. This is important. He says they take them down to the valley, and they kill them. We got to kill some things. It's time some of those sinful things that have been fighting and warring against our spirit, we can't just kind of let them go, let them go back to their place. Elijah takes them and he kills them. Where's our allegiance? Y'all with me? This is heavy stuff, but this is, Elijah says, no more. The prophets of Baal, these false worshipers, these false prophets, they must die. And he's saying to the people of God, there's some parts of your heart it's time to kill because they don't unite with the heart of God. And you've got to cut those things off. And I love when, when, in the Psalms when they talk about the purifying of the gold, right? It says you bring it to the refiner's fire, the fire of God, the all-consuming fire of God. And it says, it says it burns out the chaff. The chaff is the, the impurities, those things that don't belong in the purity. It says when the fire hits those, it burns those things out. That's what God wants to do in our life. He wants to burn out those things that don't belong. You all with me? All right, so then the story continues, and Elijah then, he takes the prophets down, they kill the prophets, and he looks at Ahab, and he says, Ahab, it's going to rain. It's going to rain. It's going to rain. So Ahab goes up to this mountain, and he has this, this guy come back and forth for him, and his servant comes back and forth and says, go again. Says, Trust me, the rain's coming, and finally he goes up and says, a small cloud begins to set. Remember, three and a half years of no rain. So let's go back to the beginning of the message. Y'all with me? Yes. This is important. There was a drought. Why? Because the people's hearts were dry. And something in the natural was mirroring what was taking place in the spiritual. But God's heart and the people's heart had been changed. So now the natural is going to change with it. And it says a mighty, mighty rain falls on the land. And then God's looking for the hearts of people. And, and there's some people today, maybe you're here and maybe you're dry and maybe you're weary and maybe you're broken and God is saying, I'm looking to pour my spirit out on you. To rain down my Holy Spirit, my presence on you. But you got to build an altar. And you got to build an altar of sovereignty. And you got to pick today who are you going to serve? In this case, it's the Baals, it's the Asherahs, it's Mammon, it's these Babylonian gods. For us, are we going to serve him and his kingdom? Or are we going to serve this kingdom, the kingdom of this world? Our hearts can no longer be divided. God cannot receive divided worship. Amen? It's against his nature. He is perfect. So he cannot take imperfect things upon himself. So he's looking for hearts that are devoted to him. And so here's what we're going to do in our last few minutes. We're going to build an altar. Amen? Let's all stand up. I'm going to ask you to do some things maybe that make you feel a little bit uncomfortable. But to be honest, I don't really care. <laughs> I don't, I don't, because God wants to do something in this place. And so for some people in this room, it's time to rebuild some altars in your life. You have let some things fall away and go away. And for some people in this room, you need to build an altar. This is new to you. You're like, man, what did I show up to today? I showed up to Jesus. And he demands a sacrifice. Now, here's the great thing about this. He's the sacrifice. That's why we took communion before. Amen? So there's some things in our heart we've got to give up. So I'm going to have this teen lead a song that came out a couple years ago. I love this song. It just says, oh, come to the altar. Now, I told you that, you know, when I, when I grew up, I asked my son Sammy last week. He said, what are you preaching on? I said, altars. 
I said, do you know what an altar is? He goes, yeah, that's the front of the church. <laughs> I said, well, that is, that is true. But I, I do want to just tell you that every time those stories that I shared with you last week, three stories of the altars, you know where they all took place? In front of a church. <laughs> On my knees, standing up, worship. It's where it happens. Now, we can turn this whole place into an altar, and I'm fine with that. I know for some people it might be tough, but I, I just feel like as the Lord begins to prompt some hearts, I'm just going to encourage you guys. And, and maybe the prayer team, for just a minute, we could just kind of slip to the side, just allow people to come, and then we'll pray for people at, at the end uh, of the service for to do that. But I, I just kind of want to leave our altars open for people to come and just respond, just you and God right now. And then at the end of service, we'll have our prayer team um, available to, to pray for needs. And they can stand right there. And if you need prayer during this time, um, you're going through some things and some struggles, or you need to get saved, you need to give your life, then, then just come to any one of these guys. They can lead you and pray with you. But for, for I think, a majority of us, I'm just going to encourage you to build an altar today. Put God back in that place. And for you, I encourage you maybe just to come forward to these altars and find a knee. And, you know, it says this, they, they, they fell prostrate. They fell down before the Lord. Worship is really this falling of, uh, of worship. You can do it in your seats if it makes you feel more comfortable. But I'm asking you to do something in the physical. You know, with me? to respond to what God is doing in the spiritual. And that's really what worship is. We raise our hands in the physical because we're surrendering our hearts. You with me? And so we come to the front because we're making a sacrifice. We're coming forth in the physical because of what God's doing supernaturally. So I want you to do something. I don't care what it is, to be honest, but I want you to do something physically to match what God is doing spiritually. You can turn around in your seat and get your nose, but I think a great number of you are going to just want to come up, and today you're just going to meet with God. Hey, I told you from the beginning, if you want to meet with God, build an altar. Y'all with me? The team's going to lead this great song. It says, oh, come to the altar. I'm just going to ask you to respond. Let's meet with God across this place.